Welcome to the Fantasy Forty Podcast with your host, John Jabari. I mean, I can beat the shit out of Hollywood Brown if you'd like. Matt Walker. Like the DK Metcalf of running back. And Andrew Burke. I love Hakeem Butler, actually. I'm sorry, he's starting to grow on me. Remember to like, rate, subscribe on Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify. Follow the guys on Twitter at the Fantasy Forty. Enjoy the show. Welcome. We are back. Myself, Andrew Burke, John Debari, and Matt Walker. It's been so long. I mean, we're finally all together. Vacations are finally done for the year for me, I think. I am heading out of town this weekend, but that is it. I don't want to ever leave the house again. <laughs> I just got to get out of here. But uh, I, I definitely have missed you too. Uh, you guys held it down when I was gone and uh, no call, no showed you and got an episode recorded yourself. I'm so proud of you. John, did you mastermind that or did Walker have to walk you through it? Yeah, I, I did. I, I did a little Google search and a little trial and error and I was able to successfully record and email an episode that was uh quite impressive what was even more impressive is you had the spots where i needed to uh, take a look at you know it made it very easy to edit but uh matt how's it been going bud it was again settled in and yeah john did a great job last week but i also think he's partly to blame for google hangouts getting rid of the entire <laughs> recording process of Vector August first after he, yeah, yeah. he found out he was searching for Google. Yeah. If you know anything about John's search history, yeah, he's <laughs> one most wanted lists as far as that concerned. So uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Google hang- Hangouts found out John cracked the code on how to do it. So they were like, we're shutting this shit down August 1st. But- Time to go. <laughs> <laughs> Enough uh, busting of the balls. Uh, we do want to thank our partners over at the Full Time Fantasy Network. Uh, I mean, they got big things, lots of podcasts, rankings. Uh, they also have the FFWC. Walker, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, tons of online drafts, world championship drafts and the like. They actually are doing, John, you could probably speak to this a little better in early September. And unfortunately, we just discussed this in breaking news. We're not going to be able to record on site in Las Vegas, John's home state. But they do, what is it, the is it a weekend of world championship drafts uh, live? Yeah, the they bomb? have the, the live uh, high stakes championships Um at, I don't know where it is this year, but in one of the awesome. casinos, they rent out the ballrooms and everybody just sits and does live drafts. It's a pretty big deal. I mean, to be there, it's kind of cool. You get to watch all these high stakes guys put thousands of dollars on the line for these uh, fantasy leagues. Co. It's kind of fun in person just to see that many people drafting at the same time. It's, it, it's I've went down last year and it was, uh, it's cool to see. I mean, if, even if you're, if you like coming to Vegas, it's worth checking out. Yeah, just yeah, tell you. I think we got to set a goal for ourselves. You know, all things being equal, if we have this opportunity next year, we are going. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of last minute, kind of interfered with the coaching schedule. But, uh, yeah, definitely a bummer that uh, me and Walk can't make it. Walk stock buying houses, you know, and moving around and, you know, stuff like that. But <clears throat> good things, good things. I'm sure John will be down there and, you know, shouting out the 40 on all the pods. He's probably going to guest on while he's down there, so. We'll be fine. <laughs> but uh, today, uh, two of us have finished our Scott Fishbowl team. So we're going to kind of recap, talk about what happened in those drafts. Uh, if we got sniped a little bit of, uh, you know, I don't know, timeouts, Walker. Isn't that what you're dealing with? A lot of people are timing out or your drafts are slow in general. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a couple of people that were unavailable for large stretches of this draft that have led us to a looks like slower than normal. We lost our pace as John brought to my attention this morning as the slowest draft. So we got something going in the, in the right direction, but yeah, we are in the 19th round um, at present. So still got four picks left in this draft. So hoping to wrap it up by the weekend. There's light at the end of the tunnel, Walker, three picks left, but uh, John's league won the title for fastest draft. What were you guys doing all just on a Google chat and just, your turn, your turn. <laughs> no, we didn't have a chat. Lots of us were pre-drafting. I think three of our 12 were in the top three fastest drafters for the whole thing. I mean, I, I 
had my first couple picks. My longest pick, once I took like four hours, I wasn't home and not paying attention. But other than that, I pre-drafted close to the entire second half of mine, and quite a few of us were. So, so yeah, blew by. This is, I guess, you technically you could say my first redraft draft because obviously this is not a dynasty. We don't get to keep these teams. So uh, there were some interesting picks, but the scoring is a lot different than probably some of your home leagues and things like that. And we'll talk about that. But I did listen to your guys' episode while I was gone. Did any of your did all your strategies go out the window once that draft clock started, John? Mine was closer to the way I thought it was going to go than I imagined actually i got david johnson at eight who i did not think was going to be there after listening to uh the potathon and um i ended up going wide receiver instead of going quarterback early and then fournette fell to me and then i drafted breeze in the fourth round instead of the fifth where i could have got him it actually because i took him around earlier than i planned on it actually changed the rest of the way my draft shook up so it actually worked out good. I love my team. I, I showed it to you guys. I've posted it on Twitter. I am, I could not possibly be happier, minus maybe a Jalen Samuels or Austin Eckler sighting on here. The, the way it shook out worked out pretty much how I'd hoped. I mean, we did put our teams out there, but we got a whopping like 10 votes or something like that. So uh, we'll just watch that <laughs> survey, uh, Walker. But, I mean, you had plenty of time to uh, think over your picks, it sounds like, in your draft. But uh, did your strategy go out the window or, you know, did you kind of stay true to what you wanted to do in that draft? Well, the funny thing is we closed with a whopping 15 votes on that poll because of our listenership, obviously. And I won it. Oddly enough. <laughs> and what makes it even funnier is I voted for John's team. <laughs> as far as, <laughs> as far as three teams, honestly. Didn't even vote for mine, but <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yeah, I was, I think when John and I spoke, I said, I am 100% taking Joe Mixon at 112. And probably going running back, running back was the statement. So I think Mixon, Dalvin Cook was almost a foregone conclusion for me if both were available. Well, on the clock at 112, both were available. And I took neither. <laughs> 112 or the 201 it it just I don't know why but um Mahomes was sitting there and if he regresses you know to the mean he still could and should be quarterback one um you know so taking him at 112 made enough sense to me um and then rather than taking either of those running backs at the 2-1 I took Odell Beckham um who was the fourth wide receiver off the board I just think he has tremendous upside in Cleveland. He's finally got a competent quarterback <laughs> throwing him the ball. Baker is going to try to make him succeed. And I could honestly, what I said in a, in a Twitter message, I think I have the QB one and the wide receiver one in fantasy this year. So it was hard to pass up that start, but it compromised my running back uh, position because then obviously picking at the two one, I have to wait two rounds before I can pick again. Yep. I mean, <clears throat> the turns are kind of tough. I was in a, I have don't I can't really call ever drafting from the three spot. So uh, I like to be in that middle section. John, what were you like? Seven, eight, or eight. eight. Yeah, we were all in tremendously different spots. I can tell you, I hate the edges. I mean, you're just sitting there. You can't predict anything. Like, just throw it out the window. You just <laughs> really got to take your guys um, when you're picking because there's zero chance they're making it back to you, quote, you know, quote, unquote. I mean, you're just 22 picks between your picks or whatever it is, 23 picks. Right. So, so I mean, real quick, quick, quick little rundown on my one, three. Uh, I did get one of the top four backs. <clears throat> I got McCaffrey because it went Barkley or actually Zeke went one oh one, then Barkley. And then um, I took McCaffrey. So I had to sit there and wait. I'm like, I'm just seeing all these names fly off the board. I'm like, it's fucking over. It's over. So I panicked. I panicked. And, panicked uh, in the second. <laughs> I panicked in the second round and took uh, George Kittle. Uh, but I was seeing guys draft him in the first round. So I didn't feel too bad there at 210. I took Kittle and then uh, Fournette after that, a few picks. And then I had to grab a quarterback before it got too late and took Baker. Tyreek Hill in the fifth round. We'll see how that shakes out. Uh, I caught a little flack from some in the league, you know, but uh, that's how it goes when you draft someone that's accused of those things. And then I stole Godwin in the six ten spot and then oh. stacked him with Winston. 
I don't know. Walker rubbed off on me there. This is a listen to this six ten seven three eight ten. Chris Godwin, Javis Winston, Eric Ebron. Walker would have been in the bathroom for sure. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I, I don't mind it with the stack. I mean, that was something I did, and I was surprised. I, I've been going on that Roto Grinders uh, app that uh, Josh ADHD has put together, and I'm really surprised how many people didn't go with any quarterback tight end quarterback wide receiver stacks because when you get to the playoffs and need to accumulate tons of points to advance I mean it's just a it's you know a basic DFS strategy 101 you need those doubles you know what I mean I ended up with Breeze and Michael Thomas and Trubisky and Trey Burton the Trey Burton one obviously isn't super high-end stack but you know, Breeze and Thomas come playoff time. If they connect for two touchdowns, I'm getting 20 points before we even start factoring in the yardage. So, I, I that was the one thing I've noticed on a lot of rosters was the lack of stacking by other teams. And yeah, and the burden thing, you don't even have to. I don't feel like stack. You know, with their number one receiver, I mean that burden one could you know pay dividends as well, especially in the tight end premium format. Walker, yeah. did you stack at all? I didn't, but I took my home, so there was no way I was getting <laughs> healthy. Um, I was thinking of Tyreek Hill. I forget at what point, but he went before I was comfortable taking him, so my homes didn't afford me any options. And uh, Sammy Watkins, we, we know I love, actually went pretty early um, as well, so wasn't an option with my homes. I ended up getting Derek Carr and Mariota um, in the ninth and tenth rounds. Mariota, mm-hmm. instant regret. Shouldn't have done it. Um, looking back to the way my roster shook out, didn't need a third quarterback, especially with Mahomes, but not really much that I could stack. Waller went before I could have got him with Carr, and uh, Delaney Walker went pretty early in my draft as well for Mariota. Um, Johnny Smith is still sitting out there, and he's someone I'm probably going to consider in 21 or 22. Um, hey, 22, you could get a nice share. Keelan Doss. Oh, my God. Hold on, John. Keelan Doss, a real person? He is, is in he, fact. Is he going to? He's gonna I like how people responded to that uh, Twitter. Clearly, don't listen to our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, his uh, did not stack. But John, I agree with you wholeheartedly. It's just there's value in that. What I found interesting, and I think I was listening to Matt Kelly's podcast about how those five point bonuses really devalue the tight end premium aspect of things, and it seemed to shake out as. Tight ends didn't fly off the board as I would have expected. But then when they did in those middle rounds, they kind of all got scooped up. Um, But I didn't take a tight end until the 11th round. And I got Trey Burton as tight end 17 overall in my draft in the 11th round. And not too unhappy with that. And I paired him with Jordan Reed in the 14th as tight end 21. I'll ride with those two guys as my tight ends uh, in this league. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, Especially, you know, after your first two picks, you know, Mahomes and who'd you get, Od- Odell? So, mm-hmm. you know, you kind of got to attack where you want after that because those are two potential one overall. So that's nice. Let's get to the later rounds. <clears throat> and it doesn't have to be all Scott Fish, but we can throw some ADP that we'll get from the uh, Full Time Fantasy Network as well. And, uh, you know, talk about some of these late round guys you kind of want to target right now before any injuries happen in the preseason and stuff. Uh, you know, you can kind of start prepping if your home leagues draft a little early. Um, I will reference, I'll just lead things off and start with the uh, I, in the 11th round. This is before the news draft about uh, Melvin Gordon, but uh, I picked up one and only Austin Eckler at the 11 three. Um, I think even before the news, I think that's a great value in the 11th round. Um, I think he was one of the more efficient running backs uh, last year. So with the news of Gordon, not that I want to see him hold out. I'm pretty stoked about that pick because uh, I saw in other drafts once that news dropped, he moved up quite a few rounds. Yeah. And before John goes off with his, I told you so, it was about loving Austin Eckler and how good he was last <laughs> like year. Um, Eckler had standalone value. It wasn't, dependent on a Gordon injury. And, you know, I think that's a value pick where you got him, even if Gordon news didn't break. So, you know, certainly kudos to you on that because, you know, he showed tremendous value last year. And God forbid if Melvin Gordon actually does sit out some games this year, you're, you're going to have a fringy RB one on your hands. And we mentioned it before, just kind of, you know, tying it back to the Scott fishbowl scoring. 
with the the bonuses at 50 yards, him rushing for 50 and catching a couple balls for 50 and getting 100, you know, 100 total yards from scrim, another 10 points in the bonuses is not unrealistic often. You know what I mean? I, without looking at his game log, I don't know how many times he actually did it, but it's certainly within the realm of possibility. And if Gordon does miss any time, I mean, I, I would say it's a likely outcome more often than not. Yeah, so yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> the ADP here on full-time right now, as it stands, has him going in the eighth round, just right at the beginning of the eighth. So um, obviously it's a little different scoring, but – I think the value's there. I don't know how it pans out. It kind of depends on the situation, don't you think, Walker? You know, where he's going to end up going once the real redraft season gets going because uh, he could move up to the fifth or sixth if Gordon's like, you know, stands pat and tries to pull the Le'Veon Bell, no? Yeah. I mean, I <clears throat> I don't know what well, and Gordon's true intents are. I get why he is holding out, but, you know. I think he's doing it with the wrong team because I don't see how the Chargers are going to cave um, for him. But, yeah, we're two months from the NFL, right, or three months. 50 yeah. days. Well, to just jump on the Gordon bashing, he – I mean, what's the char- – the Chargers <laughs> are notoriously cheap, and what's their incentive to pay him? You know, his rookie year, he had zero touchdowns. That's a fact. He's oh, missed yeah. games every year, so he hasn't been durable. He's shown he can, for lack of a better term, be a bust and not produce. I mean, obviously, touchdowns are fluky. But going into a negotiation, that I mean, that's what I would bring up if I'm the Chargers GM. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, the, he didn't score. Is, I get, and I think we all get why he wants to hold out to get paid. But we also all get why he's not currently or likely to get paid. <laughs> that is well, yeah. the replaceability of the position and the injury-prone nature of it. I mean – you're looking at Todd Gurley right now, who has an albatross contract for the Los Angeles Rams, that although he's still going to be good, he doesn't look like he's ever going to be that Todd Gurley again. Nope. And you want to give Melvin Ingram, or Melvin, Ingram, Melvin Gordon a similar contract, you know, and have to work your way around that for the next two to three to four years, as far as the salary cap's concerned? I mean, <clears throat> and I don't see him getting it somewhere else, though, too. It's not like uh, they're not giving him out. Not That's with this thing. draft class coming up. I don't see any, yeah. you know what I mean, market for him. And he's panicking. But the thing is, he's at that podium saying, you know, regular backs, yeah, you can replace them. But great backs, while he's standing on two sticks, like his legs look like mine. I mean, <laughs> like, dude, you got to have a little thickness to last. I mean, you can't deny his production. Uh, but you also can't deny that he's in the same division as the Raiders and the Chiefs who have had a great defense. Yeah, the Broncos have been formidable um, here and there the last few years. But, I mean, he gets to play those guys twice a year. And those are, you know, pads from stat games. And I'd have to look at the splits to kind of compare against, you know, the top 10 defenses, how he actually performs. Yeah, I mean, suffice to say, we're not a pro Melvin Gordon podcast. So <laughs> I he, think he's not going to pan out well uh, from any of the three of us as far as his yeah the, the footing that he has for for a new contract. I think this is the first bashing we've given him in a long time. It looks like we're getting back into season form, gentlemen. Uh, oh, but <laughs> he's teeing it up for us. Begging <laughs> for more money, not playing. Go fuck yourself. Why don't you give uh, one of your first uh, late round flyers that uh, people want to attack? So, yeah, I didn't go too deep here in the 11th round. Um, I took Geronimo Allison, who I talked about before. Uh, One of the interesting things, so I looked at the ADP from uh, Fantasy Pros, and then I compared it with the um, current ADP from the FFWC early online drafts. So a lot of times these uh, FFWC, the FFPC, they have – you know, a lot of money on the table here. So these high end high stakes drafts tend to go a little different. So in those leagues, Geronimo Allison is going 91st overall in the kind of general fantasy pros ADP. He's going uh, um, 117th. So the high stakes guys are taking him 26 picks earlier than he's going in most common drafts. So that was kind of something my pinpointed on as we go on on a few guys who are getting really overdrafted by guys who have big money on the line so to me that's another good sign to buy him at his current price for for redraft this year and if you could get him cheap in dynasty 
Uh, Walker, what do you think? Because uh, there's a lot of news about old MVS. You know, like he is definitely the number two. You, you agree there? <clears throat> well, the funny thing is, and John referenced the, the FFWC rankings, Allison is at 91, Scantling is at uh, 94. So they're they're it's almost similar. <laughs> like whoever goes first, the other one's getting snatched up a few picks right and, behind and- because we don't know. But what we do know is there's a ton of value in the wide receiver too in Green Bay. I still believe it's Allison. Um, what he was doing early in the season before he got injured was super impressive. And Scantlin's just developmental still. You know, he's only in his second year. He's probably going to grow as a player. But if I had to put money on one of them having a top 24 season, it's going to be Allison. Well, here's the thing, though, too. I don't even care if – now that Scantling gets the number two spot because they've already been talking about Allison playing out of the slot. And I think he's six, three, and I think he's over 200 pounds. So that's, that's actually better for him in, you know, most people play PPR nowadays too. You're going to give me the, the big body guy in the slot for, for green Bay. I think that actually boosts his value. He may get fewer snaps on the field necessary, but even with fewer snaps, I think the slot role is more beneficial to him for fantasy purposes. Is this offense inept enough to handle three wide receivers Walker? Because it feels like it was Jordy Nelson, Randall Cobb forever. They don't really ever use the tight end unless it's against the Cowboys. But I mean, I don't think we've seen it before. I mean, last year he was throwing it to whoever because, you know, he had to. But uh, I don't know if I'd totally buy into a huge rebound year for Aaron Rodgers at this point. Um, I mean, I, I do buy into the Aaron Rodgers rebound year, and I think if for nothing else, just to stick it to Mike McCarthy. I, I, think, that's, <laughs> I think that's common. <laughs> so That's, that's true. <laughs> I'm going to disagree with that. You know, he, this could, he could go scorched earth. Um, but – Hopefully they're more balanced for our boy Aaron Jones' sake because we all love that guy, and so we don't want Rodgers throwing it, you know, sixty percent of the time. But um, I don't know if the wide. I'd have to look into the wide receiver three and see how they fared in Green Bay. I don't think many wide receiver threes are that fantasy relevant on any team, um, regardless. So it, it you do want the guy that ends up getting the most targets from Aaron Rodgers. That's not named Devontae Adams, but I got to think there was a brief period of time where there was a. Jordy Nelson, Greg Jennings, James Jones type triumvirate. Oh, yeah. that, that might have worked. Yeah, James Jones would get the two catches down the middle of the field with his hooded sweatshirt on. Oh, well, such a, and, such and, an underrated uh, look. Right? The, totally. the other thing <laughs> what with, I want to do. <laughs> the other thing with Aaron Rodgers, and you know, people talk about it with Brady all the time, is is him trusting his receivers. I don't know if you guys saw the story in the offseason, but the other Scantling kind of came on and then faded at the end of the season. And the report was that, uh, you know, the, there was the power struggle between Rodgers and McCarthy. And Valdez Scantling started doing exactly what McCarthy wanted to do as far as route-wise. So Rodgers was changing the play in the huddle. Valdez Scantling would look over the sideline. And uh, McCarthy was, you know, whatever. You're running a seam. And, you know, Rogers wants him to run a different route. And then he would run what the coach called. So he stopped looking at him and stopped targeting him because he didn't trust him because he didn't know where he was going to be on the field. And Rogers, you know, we've <laughs> talked about it before. He seems like a big enough prick with that would possibly carry over all off season. So, you know, we mentioned it before too. He, he likes Geronimo Allison. He trusts him. Even if he is getting, Fewer snaps. I could see him getting the looks from Rodgers earlier in a play than Valdez Scantling, even if he's on the field more. I did hear Aaron Rodgers on the Pat McAfee podcast. Um, you know, he sounded like he was, I guess, content with the new coaching. Uh, wouldn't get into what happened last year, but uh, I don't know. He sounds like he's ready to go and he trusts, he wouldn't name names, but he said some of these young guys got what it takes, but you got to get on them a little bit. So. That's a good one. Um, Walker, you got one? Listen, Aaron Rodgers might have the biggest ego of all time, but he's also probably one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time too. So he he kind of, you take the go with the bad as as far as he's concerned. But um, 
I stayed after 120 to get past the 10th round on the, the FFWC. And the first guy that jumped out at me was Deshaun Hamilton at 124 overall. Ooh, so yep. 10th round pick. <clears throat> a lot of people are jumping on Cortland Sutton. I prefer Deshaun Hamilton um, forever, for however long. Joe Flacco is uh, going to be the quarterback of the Denver Broncos. Who knows what Drew Locke's going to be in the NFL. But I like Deshaun Hamilton. He was a, he was a target monster at the end of last year. And I think that will persist. Uh, this year, I think he leads the team in targets. Um, probably not in touchdowns. That'll still go to Sutton. But you know, as a tenth round pick, I would take Deshaun Hamilton as my wide receiver four all day. Um, I got him uh, in the in the Scott Fish Bowl, and uh, he was wide receiver sixty nine overall at fifteen twelve. Damn, you got him. I, I stole him. <laughs> yeah, you got him later than I did. I got him at the 15 three. I mean, obviously just a few picks later, but um, I think everything you said, correct. I know John's been kind of secretly in love with this guy talking about his route running for the last, you know, year and a half when we were talking about rookies last year said he was one of the most polished route runners coming in the league. So I don't know. Emmanuel Sanders is posting a lot of freaking videos. And when people do that, that means, you know, they kind of struggle. <laughs> <laughs> so. hey, here's an interesting thing for you guys so I, I mentioned comparing the high stakes leagues adp versus the for lack of a better term the common man adp guess how much earlier Deshaun hamilton is going in the high stakes leagues compared to general adp i'd say four rounds yeah i mean i just off the top of my head probably i mean surprising based upon what you said i'm sure it's going to be shocking but yeah. You know, probably in like the 13th, 14th round. So Andrew hit the nail on the head. He's going 48 picks earlier in high stakes leagues. So, yeah, he's going four rounds earlier, which to me is, like I said, like I mentioned earlier, that's screaming by at his current ADP, which I think in general leagues right now is around 172, which puts him in the 15th-ish. I wonder what his his trade value is over at uh, the Dynasty Trade Calculator just to – figure that out because you know even in dynasty i know this is a redraft show i don't think his value is crazy up there i mean I'm somebody say it's greater than john ross's if i remember correctly <laughs> john <laughs> ross is like a a four whatever he ran in the 40 right like a 40 yeah. four or something he's a negative value you gotta yeah. check just to get rid of him Oh, Jesus. But um, no, I, I love Deshaun Hamilton there. Um, John, you got another one? I, I actually got kind of a comparison. I was curious what you guys thought. So if you had to pick right now, you're on the clock, pick in between Kiki Kuti, our man, or Anthony Miller, who do you like? Uh, just because Will Fuller can't stay healthy and because of Miller's shoulder injury, I have to go Kuti I don't know. I'm starting to buy into these little hype threads I'm seeing all over Twitter. No rookies came in and caught 11 balls or some shit like that. So Gutierrez for me. Who do you like, Walker? Miller. Okay, so (laughs) general ADP, Gutierrez is uh, roughly 131st. Anthony Miller is 149th. In the high stakes leagues, Gutierrez is 90th. Uh, Anthony Miller is uh, 100th. So they're both going about a little bit over 40 picks earlier in the high stakes leagues with Coutier ahead of them. Now, what's interesting to me, we meant you just talked about the dynasty trade calculator. So I ran both of them through DTC and Anthony Miller is at 10.9 and Coutier is at 4.6. So the trade value, according to DTC, is in Miller's favor, even though he's being drafted later in all formats right now i got so, per dtc i was correct yeah yes. whatever i just think a lot of that i think part of i don't know i don't do the uh calculator i don't know the algorithms but uh, i think a lot of it has to do with last year's production obviously miller was a little bit more productive than coutier but uh, well, coutier can, only played six games right and i just see the values flip-flopping um We'll see what Trubisky And, and to answer your question, Hamilton's actually right in between them, value-wise. Closer to Kuti, but him and Kuti are about the same. So so Miller's even uh, higher than Hamilton then? You Actually, at their current uh, value on the calculator, you could get them both for Anthony Miller. Oh, wow. 
I would do that deal in a heartbeat. Would you no, do it, Don Walker? No, yeah, <laughs> you're just done. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're you're getting deeper assets. Uh, yeah, I I love Miller, but give me the two guys. <laughs> throw more darts. You said yeah. no, Walker. No, I said I would. I was oh, gonna, I was like, yeah. Jesus, did we have a new Joe Mixon in the house? Like, I never knew you loved Anthony Miller this much. No, I do. I, I don't like him as much as uh, John does over Allen Robinson. But I do love. I like that he got his shoulder finally fixed. Supposedly that should be behind him because they said he dislocated his shoulder like six times last season, and that's just insane. Um, in the great scheme of things, Miller, Anthony Miller. Yeah, he uh, had surgery to hook it in properly, so it doesn't stop popping out of place. He's like the the Mel Gibson of uh, Lethal Weapon fantasy football. As as someone who had that problem myself in the past, it doesn't even hurt anymore. Are you playing professional football, Joe? No, but you no. just pop it back in. Doesn't even hurt. I mean, once once it's loose, it's loose. It doesn't falls out of place like a like. A poorly tied shoelace. It doesn't even matter anymore. You pop it back in and go about your business. I'm going to kind of steal John's idea right here and uh, <laughs> compare two guys for you guys to choose. Uh, one's going 159. The other one's going 161. So they're literally going in the same spot. But uh, one is Chris Thompson from the Redskins, and the other is Giovanni Bernard. Um, Obviously, guys, news came out early last week. He aggravated a hamstring or something. I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, not – you know, being able to work out full speed and then trying to finally get geared up for training camp. That's got to be what he's doing right now. And uh, the other just seems to get no love in Cincinnati right now. I think we talked about him on the uh, Pet cemetery, dragging his ass to the grave and getting him back up. But uh, I think he still has juice left. Walker, who are you choosing out of those two? I'd go with Gio. Um, I think Chris Thompson is just a, a bit player. Um, had, I think he had two big games to start last year, but – Resigned AP, and if guys comes back with any certainty, um, you know Thompson's going to have a really reduced role in in that offense. I don't care; he's a primary pass catcher. And then they drafted Bryce Love. I know we're talking redraft, but he's as good as gone um, from Washington in a dynasty perspective. So Chris Thompson's about to flame out. I have read that they intend to give Geo more work this year, and I think said ten to twelve touches a game, which would be perfect for him. Um, he can be super productive with you know five or six carries and three or four catches a game and give you a flex appeal. So I would take Gio leaps and bounds over Chris Thompson. John, I am a Geo fan. However, uh, I think Chris Thompson has an established role in Washington, even if all the other guys are healthy, which I don't think they're going to be anyway. Um, but, I, you know, with a new coach coming in, Joe Mixon ahead of him, they drafted Travion Williams and Rodney Anderson, there's a lot of competition for touches now, and I don't even know what that offense is going to look like. I I do like Geo if I knew it was the same system from last year, but with so many question marks, I like Chris Thompson knowing what his role is going to look like because it's been the same for the last, you know, seven years. So uh, Listen, neither are long for their teams. They're both <laughs> different franchises next year. Correct. Sure. Absolutely. I was just going to say, so you it took Gio in the shitty Marvin Lewis system, but this year. <laughs> I don't like the opportunity. The opportunity. We're moving on. Uh, that's great stuff. Uh, all right, Walker, before I throw it over to you, I just got to throw this out here. Name a player that's going after these guys, and we talk about them frequently. Uh, Marquise Brown, Josh Gordon's going before him, and Eli Rogers by ADP. Uh, Shit is blowing my mind that those three are going ahead of somebody. Not a sexy offense. Are you talking about Zay Jones? Yes, I am. And uh, Zay Jones is going 177, Walker, uh, behind those guys. In redraft, I'd take Zay Jones. Yeah, I mean, we could pull this back to Scott Fishbowl. I got sniped on a, a Zay Jones two tight end combo pack right before me, like three picks were my <laughs> huge, all three guys. It was Zay Jones and one of the two tight ends. All three went in three picks, and I'm like, well, that's what happens when you, you draft on the edges. But um, I think it's going to be interesting to see what Buffalo does, but Jones had, what, seven touchdowns last year, five of them in the last five games. You know, I wish he could play the Dolphins every week because he – beat them up for two touchdowns each in those, you know, two of those games in the last five. But 
him and uh, <clears throat> Josh Allen seem to develop a connection. He got over 100 targets last year. I can't see why he doesn't do it again. Um, John Ross isn't going to be a target vacuum. Who knows what Cole Beasley is going to be? And Robert Foster still largely an unknown. So, yeah, I'll take Zay Jones. Definitely. I mean, Eli Rogers. I mean, what are we talking about here? Eli Rogers probably won't even make the Pittsburgh Steelers roster. You know, so I don't know if they thought he was someone else, but certainly taking him before Eli Rogers. That's what blows my mind is even the Zay Jones situation in Buffalo. It's like people find something to latch on to. Yes, Foster's a bigger receiver, is athletic. You know, he's a big guy and he showed us a little bit there. Then they just throw Zay Jones as the curb. They're like, Foster is the guy in Buffalo automatically without seeing even more production. Have we found where Foster's at? With, without, 137. Holy um, hell. I was just going to say, without cheating, you, you know. guys know how much further up he is. Yeah, 40 picks earlier, Foster. They, they do not deserve that variance, you know, nor some of these people that are getting picked in between. Um, Marquise Brown could be huge, but he's going to be volatile his rookie season in Baltimore. I mean, we've seen what Zay Jones has done. You know, Mohamed Sanu, you can have him. I'll take Zay Jones. Marquise Goodwin, <laughs> his ship has sailed. I, I mean, I could I could see 20 picks earlier with Zay Jones with little argument as far as I'm concerned. Adam Humphreys going to Tennessee's offense? No, I'll take Zay Jones. The, now we're at 150. You know, that's, that's criminally so undervalued. I'm, in my opinion. I'm glad this happened organically. I ran... Zay Jones and uh, Robert Foster through Dynasty Trade Calculator. Which side would you rather have? Zay Jones or Robert Foster and uh, mid-fourth rounder? I mean, before we answer, we are just killing our sponsors right now. We are <laughs> on point. <laughs> We're just left, right, center. Yes, we are. We're doing good. We're doing good. Uh, I will take still Zay Jones. Yeah, I don't know that it's close. For me, I mean, I don't feel see where DTC ends up, but I, I want Zay Jones. It's it's a perfectly even trade, so either, there was no right answer, but that's what it would basically uh, Robert Foster plus a middle mid uh, fourth round pick to acquire Zay Jones or vice versa. I, I in best ball, I I love uh, Robert Foster. Sure, uh, but yeah, for. The thing, the guy's got tons of upside, but yeah, the, the injuries are scary and playing with fucking Josh Allen's terrifying. I mean, what confuses me is signing John Brown, who thrives in doing what Robert Foster was successful at for the Bills last year. I'm not saying that Foster can't be a, more than just a deep threat. You know, you, we haven't really seen much of Robert Foster. He didn't get much of an opportunity at Alabama when his undrafted free agent and then kind of had some glimmers of, uh, fantasy stardom last year but john brown is going to be the primary deep threat for them which takes some of that boom appeal from robert foster yeah and zay jones is going to lose some of the possession -y type shit to cole beasley i mean i think they both got devalued by the additions just none of them enough <laughs> to really make me have a strong opinion either way i just I don't think I want anything to do with the Buffalo pass again. No, that whole offense. And I think if I'm not mistaken, that was one of the least drafted teams going into Scott Fishbowl using the um, that Roto Grinders app. And and exactly paralleling what you said, every move they made devalued everybody on their team. At, at running back, you know, drafting guys, signing, you know, bringing in Yeldon, bringing Frank Gore. It makes – all four of those running backs worthless. Bringing in those wide receivers makes everybody less worthless until this, you know, shakes out in camp. I'm not touching anybody on this team. I was just going to say in a redraft format, you know, it's going to be more of Buffalo is going to be on the waivers after maybe week one, week two. You better yeah. run, run to your waivers after you see maybe a game or two. But I wouldn't be dropping, you know, certain guys for them either, you know, just because of a one big game. Because you really – you guys both brought up good points. You really never know what's going to happen. I think Josh Allen takes off running and he's, oh, shit, there's one of my guys and just tries to get it, get him the ball. I don't think you can really game plan for who his go-to guy is going to be. So Listen, stay in there. We're talking about organic – in that backfield, Devin Singletary is going at pick 135 in the FFWCs right now. Can you guess where TJ Yeldon is being drafted? Oh, it's got a – No way any of you look this one up. Rock bottom. <laughs> Go ahead. Give me your worst. Uh, 222. I was going to say 230. 230? 
30 on the net. Yeah. That's a yeah. hell of a guess. I had him written down. We're talking about values. I mean, give me a break. I, he is a Shady McCoy trade or cap release away from returning value like he did last year. And for those that don't remember, he was an RB2 last year. Yep. Yep. Or is not going to carry the load in Buffalo. And you're thinking a rookie, Devin Singletary, who I think has upside, he's going to be a gadget player. If McCoy is traded or cut, TJ Yeldon's going to have the most carries. <laughs> Buffalo goes back to. I think Frank Gore might pull an Anquan Bolden and say, fuck it, and go, we're shy at halftime after week I don't one. I think he's ever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, remember it wasn't it Anquan that went there and he's like fuck there this were, I retire several guys that have done that recently didn't somebody do it in Buffalo after game two last year that's what I'm saying I thought it was I I'm saying Antonio it. Brown tried to do it before he even landed in Buffalo but too. Oh, yeah. no, I think Anquan retired in camp didn't he did he make it to the season just left his jersey on the field like I'm that's good. that's true now, someone did it at halftime John is right he's like I'm not coming out he's a quit. defensive guy Oh, was it uh, Vontae Davis? Was it? Yeah. I, I won't, even if you say I, the name, I'm going to have to, our fact checker's not in the office today, son of a bitch, took the day <laughs> off. So, uh, more vacation than you do, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I have TJ Eldon in all my dynasties, and especially PPR, man, which all of them are. But uh, that dude, yeah. that dude I... is under, under, I don't know, he's just, under the radar and he always performs and i drafted him in scott fish uh the 16 10 spot so that's like 202 overall so maybe i was a little early but uh i saw him sitting there and all of the running backs were there singletary went a little before then but uh i think uh mccoy no one was touching which is understandable so pj yeldon had 900 north of 900 yards 55 catches and five touchdowns last year in a part-time role in Jackson. And nobody wanted that guy this offseason. No. no. Just begging, begging for a job. Cardboard sign. We'll rush for food. Yeah, it's crazy. He ended up, and he, didn't he get like here. a little league minimum, vet minimum deal or something? No, get? we looked it up before. It was a little more than we thought. A couple, couple million bucks. <clears throat> I thought for sure he was going to end up in uh, New England. That just seems like a guy they would just, instead of drafting Damian Harris, just pick up TJ Yeldon for pennies on the dollar. Yeah. You, you know, what's kind of crazy is also Jordan Howard and Miles Sanders are literally going within like five picks of each other. And I don't understand that. I think it's just with some of the no no news about Miles Sanders. There was no real OTA videos of him breaking tackles with no one around him. And so I think people are getting a little scared there. <laughs> It's going to be interesting. It's going to be a slow grind in Philadelphia. I still think first half of the season is going to be Jordan Howard. Second half of the season is going to be Miles Sanders, which doesn't help anyone in redraft. But we're talking in that ADP range. Latavius Murray at 81, just one pick. Oh, Howard, oh, love him. him all day long. I wanted him so bad in the fishbowl as my RB3 and got, I can't say snipe because he went well before I was going to pick. But I think. People are just sleeping on him and not thinking that New Orleans can return two high-end running backs um, as they've done countless times. What what would you be willing to give up for him in a dynasty league this year? If you're making a move and you want to get him. Oh, I'd what... give up a second. Second. Yeah, I'm not giving up a 2020 first for him. No. Because See, a second, second seems – with the what the caliber of the class is, I think a second carries some cachet. I'd give him a second and a player that I'm not too high on, but yeah, I think he's a guy that is going to be an RB two this year. I'm too you can almost chicken shit to pull the trigger on a second. To me, I was going to say a third. I think yeah, a second I'm, probably I'm, fair. I'm just yeah, but you wouldn't trade him for a third. Yeah, I almost got to think right. What, what would I trade him for? Throw in Dante Moncrief and like a third or fourth, and you can get him. Nobody wants Dante Moncrief. I, I do. I'm buying in. That's that's my sleeper this year. I hate I hated him, but this is the year when everyone gets off the Moncrief chain. That's when I jump on. This is the year. <laughs> He's out of here already. Hey, I already been swooping up Martavis Bryant. He's been you know. Oh, there you go. That's a Burke guy. You know, he's a, he's he, uh, eating his lunch in Oakland now. So yeah, but he he applied for reinstatement, so I went and scooped him up. Martavis is coming back. The pot contingent is going to be back in the NFL. Uh, 
Randy Gregory's applying for reinstatement. Josh Gordon's already catching passes from Brady. He'll be somehow activated by <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, I swear, old uh, what's his name, Robert Kraft or whatever his name is, got Goodell into one of those shops with him. He's like, "Come on, man, let's just go have a conversation." But uh, I mean, any anybody else? Uh, somebody that stuck out to me, uh, uh, good old Seattle Seahawks, David Moore, going 192, which is about t- 20 spots higher than average ADP. But, you know, he finished last year wide receiver 36. He's being drafted this year as wide receiver 84. I just think he's being way overlooked. I mean, the Seahawks, they lost Baldwin, obviously. Lockett's coming in as the one. They drafted Metcalf, they drafted Ursua, they drafted uh, Gary Jennings. So you've got a lot of unproven rookies, and you've got a guy who played well with Russell Wilson last year. So to get, you know, wide receiver three, possibly value, there's no reason he can't end up worst case scenario, wide receiver 48, wide receiver four with the last pick in your draft, 21st, 22nd round, just throwing some wild darts there at the end. I, I like the upside he has. I agree. Um, I think they're going to give Metcalf every opportunity. Correct. <laughs> to him be on the field uh, with Lockett. So D- Moore's probably going to be their wide receiver three pretty early on. But at that price point, he's, he's a free dart throw, and he's someone that I have my eyes on at the end of the fishbowl, actually, because and, and, he could and, yeah, have boom games or if an injury happens. He's the only one that outside of Lockett has any rapport with Russell Wilson already. So, and for me, kind of what I did uh, at towards the end of the fishbowl was looking at you know what number this guy would be. So, like for me, for example, I got Trey Quinn in the nineteenth, who was wide receiver eighty. So when I was drafting towards the end, I was like, can this guy return better value than wide receiver eighty? And I mean, that's an astonishing yes, especially with this scoring. So kind of the same thing with uh, Moore, how I was looking at some of the um, FFWC stuff here. Wide receiver, or 192 overall, roughly wide receiver 84. That he, I mean, even if he's wide receiver 80, you're re- getting a nice return on investment. But he's probably going to be wide receiver 40 or higher. So you're getting a hell of a return on that. He's going to outperform tons of guys who are going ahead of him. And to me, towards the end, I'm trying to get value or guys who can pop on a given week. I mean, in that same range, it's funny you mentioned more at 192 because Trey Quinn is 193 um, in the FFWZ right now. But 189, Marquise Lee. I took him in, I think, the 17th round uh, of the fishbowl. And while I think Didi is their clear wide receiver one now, Marquise Lee is a forgotten man because of his ACL injury that happened in the preseason. So he's going to be a year removed by the time he's back on the field. And he's put some productive fantasy seasons um, up before and now has a competent quarterback. I think Marquise Lee at 189, he can be a wide receiver three this year with little shock, in my opinion. If you want to bash somebody, you know, you mentioned John Ross. You're talking about him goofing around earlier. I took him in the 20th in Scott Fishbowl. He is currently 248 in the high stakes leagues, which is actually 19 spots lower than he's going in general ADP. So he's somebody that the high stakes guys are not getting any part of. So actually that kind of is giving me pause. I think I got all hyped up when you brought up the seven touchdowns a couple weeks ago. So now I'm not going to pump the brakes a little bit if the big money isn't on him i think i'm gonna start cooling off on him myself well listen just to make you feel a slight bit better i also drafted john ross recently in the (laughs) of the fishbowl and he was wide receiver 77 overall so seven touchdowns 77 overall value i wouldn't take him in the 17th now he's in the 18th john ross no way (laughs) he works at wide receiver 77 (laughs) <laughs> this just can't happen. I'm yeah. trying to find Jalen Richard on this, and I'm I'm really struggling because <laughs> I, I got him in the uh, 19th round, and I know, Walker, you're huge on Jacobs, but I just still – I don't think his role goes away. So uh, uh, I'm so huge on Jacobs that he's my running back one in the Scott Fishbowl, and I am crazy. really happy with that. Um, I did see Richard on here, 176 overall. Uh for Richard. 
going around the likes of CJ Anderson and Justin Jackson at present. I've got one last big faller for you guys. There he is. It's the biggest difference of the people I saw, negative anyway. Uh, Philip Dorsett is going 50 spots lower in the high stakes leagues. And he's somebody I thought, oh, well, with the vacancies in New England and blah, 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 maybe he can do a little something this year. But ugh. yeah, if the big money guys are drafting him 288th overall, that's pretty disgusting. Where are they drafting uh, Demarius Thomas, if at all? I heard he's getting cut. Uh, I don't see his name, but I'm yeah. not even going to look. Fuck him. Yeah, garbage. garbage. They don't have much. Listen, I don't see his name anywhere on here. I wonder if Gronk is going before them. <laughs> and he's not even playing. He should. <laughs> um, I, I got Philip Dorsett in a couple leagues uh, just as like a throw-in. Like, you know, there's... 298. Too high. Too high. Listen, he's counting three bigs after Rashad Perriman. Let's just let that sink in. (laughs) So (laughs) it was a nice career to Marius, but I agree. You're throwing Achilles, you're like flipping your car over with people in it in the (laughs) offseason. You totally moved on, my man. (laughs) So it was a nice run in Denver, but you will never, you're not, he's not going to be anything for the page. Not that it. guy's mother got out of prison, and his life has—he's n- never been the same. His mother was in prison. Jeez. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So was his grandmother. His Not grandmother and mother were big time drug dealers, and his mom's been in prison uh, most of his life. He was raised by his uh, former drug dealing grandmother, and uh, his mom got out of prison like the week of the Super Bowl, whenever that last Super Bowl uh, game was for him. Funny and then now, all that story about his mother being at the Super Bowl, but totally <laughs> disconnected the whole rationale behind it. But now I'm in favor. I want the Marys Thomas to, to be something. <laughs> uh, we like those stories. But, uh, I'm away from Josh Gordon when he gets reinstated. That's that's probably something that the Patriots need to keep in mind. You know, there's some crazy you know, moms out there that these players have to deal with. I think Des Bryant's mom was like Oof. a hooker slash crackhead or something at some point. Oh, so that was a famous... Uh, what a combine story, right? With this. Oh yeah. <laughs> There's, I think, a video of him like, "Get the fuck out of here, mom." I don't know. <laughs> there was a video of him, yeah, dragging a woman into or out of a car, allegedly. A, yeah. a surveillance cam video that's never. Look, nowadays that thing doesn't exist. If it existed, it would have been released already. Oh, Jerry Jones pulled some strings on that one for sure. Nah. For, uh, um. Mm-hmm. Put a bow on this. Rob Gronkowski, two forty-five overall. So you are right. Gronkowski is still being drafted ahead. I knew of it. Thomas, who is currently retired <laughs> and dropped significant weight, <laughs> as we've all seen, living his best life <laughs> on Twitter. If he plays this year, if it is going to literally be when it does not matter for fantasy, living like he's Andrew Burke, <laughs> <laughs> drops twenty-five pounds a day. Vacations, yep. drinking, vacation. Yeah, Follow my mail. Yeah. Wow, you should have seen my mailbox. Jesus. Ignoring responsibilities. Yeah. <laughs> totally. You guys, you guys got it. Jerking responsibility. <laughs> you sons of bitches. Um, so it looks like this year, I'm going to go ahead and close it down. Um, we are going to have to do the all 32. I think we're going to break it down into 14, obviously, the divisions, AFC, NFC, and then we'll do the you know north and south and all that stuff. Uh, sound good to you guys. I think that might be the next, you know, yes, sir. Round of shows. Two 10 minute clocks on each team and stick to the 40. Is that possible? We have yes. A and just yes. On next, next day. Whatever we don't get to, we just don't get to it. Not yeah. that important. So we all get to button it up. Sounds good to me. That'll, that'll uh, push us to the test because we like to go on side tangents about Melvin Gordon and his chicken People's legs. Criminal mothers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, crack dealers and all that stuff. So we'll try to keep it reined in, but uh, we'll still have some fun. <laughs> teen, teen prostitution. <laughs> oh, man. But uh, it, was def- it was definitely good to uh, be back, guys. Um I think uh, it's going to be a good off season. I mean, I'm just ready for training camp. See who blows their knees out. Not that I want to see it, but uh, we, ju- we just got 
we just got, this is when the teams really start to take form and dynasty. You know, uh, all those trades you made this offseason, some could come and bite you in the ass and some could be like, ha ha, you know, to your fellow league mates. But uh, that's just how the cookie crumbles. But it'll really give us a better perspective on redrafts and what to expect and uh, maybe the touches where they're going to go. So big things coming. I'm excited. Uh, anything else, Walker? Nah, I'm good. Let's uh, button this one up and dive into that all 32. I'm excited. Yeah. Me too. So it's always a good conversation. It usually enlightens me to a few things going into redraft. Well, and it would not be a show if one of our children did not make an appearance. So there we go. Got that. Is that mine? <laughs> I don't know whose it was. It might be mine. I locked him in the closet and told him to be quiet. John's outside. Yours are in the closet. <laughs> mine are gone. That's yours. That's, oh, a, good. that's a walker shot. All right. And I was like, the red light's not beeping on the, the door I have. You know, the little red light bulb, like they're trying to get out. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, We'd like to, once again, thank our partners over at the Full-Time Fantasy Network. Guys, we did get some new ratings on uh, the old, what do they call it now, Apple Podcast. So uh, thank you. We appreciate it. Don't have the name in front of me. We'll give you a shout out on the next episode. But thanks for taking the time and leaving a rating. For the rest of you that haven't done it, do it. Please, it helps us out. It gets us more listens. Uh, but remember, we're at Apple Podcasts now. I, uh, what else? Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean. Um, wherever you want to go, we're there. And uh, We're literally everywhere. We cool. are. And, but go. make sure, give us some followers on Twitter, too. At, Play. Are we on Google Play? We are. We are. Nice. At the Fantasy 40 on Twitter. You know, I, Play going away as well since uh, Google Hangouts is going away. You know, whatever we're on, we're trying to keep that on the DL. That's why I didn't mention it. They're probably listening. They're like, they're on Google Play. Delete it. But uh, <laughs> down. Take uh, it down. Till next time, for myself, Andrew Burke, John DeBari, Matt Walker, we are the Fantasy 40, and we're signing off.